Thank you for tuning into this presentation. My name is Adriana and I work as Platform Strategy Architect, being part of the chapter called Portfolio Management and Strategy Innovation at Enterprise Architecture. It's the ING that enables me to do my thing, which is digging into the ecosystem innovation and platform organization and spreading the understanding of my own understanding. This presentation covers the basics of platform thinking and innovation. She is the physical Adriana, I am the digital one, and I am going to be accompanying you throughout the whole presentation. So let's get right into it. Let me start by saying that what we are witnessing is a fundamental shift in how we organize ourselves as a society at large. Technology is the main driver of that shift. Allow me to take this very simple model to describe how organizations have been creating value for the past century. This is where we come from. There is a business that creates the value and there is someone we call our customer that consumes that value. A very passive and linear relationship. Let's unpack this relationship a bit. And I like to take Apple as an example. There is a whole value chain filled up with activities prescribed and controlled by Apple. From the design of their chip and patented covering of an iPhone, all the way through its manufacturing, packaging and selling in retail stores. Input, output. However, an iPhone is worthless if you can't use it. The majority of the apps that are in the Apple App Store are not created by Apple. There are more than 20 million developers registered on iOS and these developers are not on the payroll of Apple. Can you imagine Spotify or Netflix being employed by Apple? So there is someone else who creates value for a user of an iPhone, Apple's customer. Which means that this model is not quite accurate. Because when I use Trello or MindNote, I am in a direct relationship with Trello or MindNote, not Apple. This is a profound shift in how we think about organizations. In Apple's platform context, the primary relationship is not between the Apple and the consumer of an app, but between the producer of the app and its consumer. And this picture is still not quite accurate. What about all the passionate app developers who not rarely take a mortgage to finance the development of their babies? Apple needs to take care of those too, with services and tools that help them create fantastic apps. This is a different ball game. It's not linear anymore. And this shift brings forward not only many opportunities, but especially new type of challenges that the platform business faces. I will demonstrate the most important challenge as follows. It's a challenge that all platform organizations of today experience. It's very difficult to let go of prescribing and controlling, just like Apple does and did. It's the distance between the platform organization and the relationship between the producer and consumer that is so difficult to determine. You may be wondering, how? What distance? What is she talking about? To make the distance challenge a bit more tangible, I'm going to show you a couple of examples of platform organizations that didn't get it right in the first place. This is Craigslist. Craigslist is an American advertisement website. You can find their cars, apartment listings and so forth, but you could find there also guns. Human trafficking was a thing, or dates that ended up tragically. Craigslist didn't care. And exactly for this reason, their section with personal ads had to be shut down by the regulator. Obviously, Craigslist was too far from the relationship between the producer and the consumer. Everybody knows Uber, the ride-sharing platform. However, according to the European Court of Justice, Uber is a transport services company requiring it to accept stricter regulation and licensing within the EU as a taxi operator. The reasons why this is the case are threefold. First of all, an Uber driver is not setting the price for the ride. It's Uber who says how much a journey is worth. Second, 
an Uber driver doesn't know the destination of the journey until a rider request has been accepted. And finally, an Uber driver can't really decline a ride, otherwise he or she is off the platform for the whole day. It's fair to say that Uber is too close to its producers. Similarly, the state of California reacted to the power of Uber and Lyft just at the end of 2019 and passed a bill that could give their drivers basic labor protections. If these companies are that close to their producers, then these producers deserve benefits that all employees get, such as unemployment insurance, healthcare subsidies, paid parental leave, and so forth. If hundreds of thousands of independent contractors in California become employees under the bill, this will have a huge impact on the balance sheets of the platforms that this applies to. Uber and Lyft are not the only platforms facing regulatory issues. Think of all the social media platforms. And hold on, we have two more examples. Try and search for a Star Wars Imperial Star Destroyer using the DuckDuckGo.com. What the search engine does is screen scraping the content of the website and providing you with a short summary of what you're looking for, without having to click on the particular link. But the producer behind that link would like you to click on that link and land on the main page of the source of the information. So while the search engine is just making consumers' life easier, it's hurting the producer. And finally, what this meme is trying to convey is the difference between how Amazon behaves towards its third-party suppliers on the Amazon marketplace and a traditional retailer. Once Amazon sees that something is selling well, it copies the product and starts selling it under its own house brand not surprisingly ranked at the top of the list. One could argue that all big retailers have done that for the past 150 years, but the scale, speed and scope that Amazon can do this with is different. This brings me to the platform definition. Given all that I have shown you so far, it's fair to say that the platform is not primarily about technology. It's not just a website or an app, or a piece of software you buy from IBM. If someone says we bought this great platform from IBM, you can be 99% sure that it's not going to be a platform, just a piece of code. Because a platform is a business model. It's a way of creating, capturing and distributing value. And this business model connects an entire ecosystem of people, organizations and things. At the same time, this business model facilitates coordinated value exchanges between the passionate people, organizations and things. What is important to highlight is that it needs to be a business model for all parties involved. Not just the business, but also for the creator of the value and for the consumer of the value. It's a positive sum game, not a zero sum. Everybody needs to win. And here is where technology comes in. Using digital services for scale, speed and scope. Where are we heading to? Who gets to innovate in this new, shifted landscape in which platforms dominate? Let's unpack this dimension with this graph. It describes how much an organization is in control of what it offers to its customers. Let's take ING and its mobile banking app as an example. That's a product that the ING bank offers to its customers. There is an experts department at ING dedicated to control every single bits and piece of that mobile banking app. No one else has a hand on building that product. ING is the only expert. This mode of creation is built on the premise that the customer is a passive consumer. 
but the export mode of creation shifts when the consumer gets actively involved. Stages of the production process shift to the user. And we are all familiar with this mode of creation. A great example is IKEA. When IKEA designs the product, provides a self-serve manual so the customer can build it itself. A rather famous IKEA product is the Kalax shelf, which is a great relationship test, but also a great product suited for places IKEA never intended to when designing this product. A restaurant in Amsterdam flipped the intent of the shelf and started using it as lamps. Who is the innovator in this case? IKEA or the restaurant? Actually, you could find this kind of flips on ikeahackers.net, where people with ideas were posting, well, hacks for the IKEA products. IKEA was trying to shut down the page until they realized that the people were innovating for them, for free. And then, there is the third mode of creation. That is perhaps the most interesting one, ecosystem innovation, when the ecosystem innovates. Take Airbnb and see how the company empowers users all over the globe. There are more than 6 million listings on Airbnb and they range from single rooms, apartments, villas, castles or tree houses. Tree houses. No one at Airbnb's product development department came up with the idea to include three houses into the inventory. No one at Airbnb came during one of their design sprints with a report from McKinsey that three houses are in and selling well. Mm -mm. No. Someone just got the idea and decided to open the doors to his or her castle to strangers. Another great example of the ecosystem innovation is Airbnb's first experience, another product type that was randomly brought to Airbnb by this Japanese lady. The lady created a sake tour instead of a listing. And her first customers were actually Airbnb's employees because they wanted to see what that is and how they could support her. Have you ever heard of AirDNA? Not affiliated with Airbnb at all, AirDNA collects short-term vacation rental data from hundreds of sources, including Airbnb to build a comprehensive view of the short-term rental market, and sells it to cities, for instance. Wouldn't it be great to incorporate this as a service to the overall Airbnb product catalog? I am asking again, who gets to innovate in this new world? People passionate about what they love and what moves them? organizations by supporting them and removing the barriers that stand between them and the thing that moves them? Or others you never thought could show up? This is ecosystem innovation. Given all the challenges and opportunities we can see popping up, it's fair to say that the world is transitioning from an age when the organizations were the experts that knew the customer well enough to be able to come up with products and services that might be suited to that particular customer segment. Just think about it, a customer segment. It's a design construct that rule an entire age. In that age, an organization designs the service and competes in doing so with other organizations. Their main driver is efficiency at scale. The bigger it gets, the more customers will show up and the further it can grow. In the world in which the ecosystem innovates, an organization designs for service to happen. It provides the context, tools and rules for the people and organizations to start creating and exchanging value. The primary driver shifts to learning at scale. That's a different ball game. How do you design for a service to happen. As experts, we know how to design a proper service. And if some organizations fall behind because they are too big to keep up, for instance, there are a plenty of best practices that can help to improve their current positions. Service design, lean startup, UX, CX, you name it. We all know these practices, hence best practices. However, there is not much to be found on designing for service. 
There are some theories, but no practices that would help you to design and build a successful organization fitting this age. This feels like a gap. And a great moment to close off this presentation. Allow me to say that this is where Vanguard architects come in to create, share and communicate the models that describe the future state of an organization. This is where the next story starts. There is a need for a new toolbox, so people understand their role and position in the platform context. This workshop is part of the platform positioning system. Together with my colleague Ron, we have facilitated a hundred of platform design workshops in the past three years. The toolkit has been modified according to feedback we received from each of the sessions. As you can see, it pairs system thinking with design thinking into platform thinking. If you download the toolkit, you will find there a manual that comes with all the material you need to start organizing and facilitating high energy platform design sessions. There is no need for expensive trainings, coaches or consultants in order to start using this tool. This was Adriana and this is Ron. Reach out to us whenever you see fit. We love to talk about these topics. Thank you for the attention you have given this presentation and see you around.